Hi, I'm Susan Taylor with Scripps Health in San Diego, California. You fall off your bike and you smack your knee. It hurts. Or maybe you're skiing and you twist your knee. It hurts. Or perhaps you're just out walking and you start to have chronic knee pain and it hurts all the time. These are all signals that you might need to have knee surgery, maybe even a knee replacement. But the good news? Technology has made surgery a lot quicker and a lot easier on the patient with a lot less downtime. To, uh, joining us to talk about the advancements in knee surgery is Dr. William Bugby. He is an orthopedic surgeon at Scripps Clinic in La Jolla, California. Thanks for being with us, Dr. Bugby. Thanks, Susan. What causes knee pain? What are the most common types of knee pain? Oh boy, there's a million <laughs> things that can cause a knee to hurt. Age is one of the most obvious. As you age, your tissues get more weak and your muscles aren't as strong, so you could have normal structure and your knees can hurt for that reason. But most of the time, it's an injury or a process that develop, you develop arthritis for no particular reason. Most of the people we see, though, you can identify something as you pointed out, whether it was an injury playing sports in high school or just chronic use playing tennis and you get older. So there's a myriad reasons, but they all help us figure out what we can do to, to make these people better. So let's say you're you know, a runner at a young age and you're running five or six miles a day. Are you, are you guaranteed to have knee problems when you get to be in your 50s and 60s just because the parts wear out? No, it's interesting. People that are able to continue jogging and do so successfully may be privileged. In other words, they don't hurt. People that hurt when they run stop running, or they should. But people that can run as they get older and older probably don't have the predisposition to get injuries. However, the 40 to 50 year old group that still wants to be active and run, they always come and say, you know, I hurt when I run now and I, it never used to be that way. And that's usually that they've injured something or they're starting to wear things out. So not everyone can be a successful runner into middle age, but those that are are probably protected from injury. It's oh, interesting. Interesting. So what causes chronic knee pain? Is it osteoarthritis? Generally, that's the term that most of the, your physicians would use and because it's so common I mean there's probably 25 to 30 percent of all Americans have some evidence of arthritis either on an x-ray or just on exam or just having pain so it's the most common disease chronic disease in the world. What is osteoarthritis? It's a good question. <laughs> um, you can call it various things degenerative joint disease it's deterioration of the structures of the joint. It's really important to understand, for example, a knee joint is not just cartilage, and most people Show think. Us. So here's a small model of a knee, and you can see most of the knee is made up of the bony structure. But at the end of the bones, what makes up the joint is thin layer of cartilage, and that's the first thing that goes bad with arthritis. Additionally, we have these gaskets, if you will, called the menisci, and they're very commonly injured as you get older because they age just like the rest of you ages and they become weaker so the small thing like playing tennis can lead to an injury of the meniscus. Once something like that happens the cascade or the events that lead to arthritis are much more likely to occur at a quicker rate. So younger people they have healthy tissues, older people have older tissues more likely to have an injury that leads down this path. If you add in all the genetics, your parents might have had arthritis, um, then you get this so-called perfect storm where you could be totally fine and be very active at 50 and within a year you've, you've had one or two operations, you're still hurting and the doctor says you have arthritis and incidentally that's an incurable disease when you get right down to it. There's no quick fix for arthritis. So how do you treat knee pain? What's the different so, avenues? Of course, we want people to have healthy lifestyles. So one of the leading causes of arthritis is obesity. You try to get people to exercise or be active within their envelope of function. Like, you know, if you're 55 and your knees hurt and you've got arthritis, why are you out trying to jog and run marathons? Do something, go to the gym, do some low impact exercise. Like, so Like ride a stationary bike. Sure, right. And, and diet, there, there's some evidence that diet helps. Inflammatory foods might make your arthritis hurt more, but those are things that people can do on their own. When they come to the doctor, then they're looking for more aggressive treatments, not just advice to change your lifestyle. So we have everything from, you know, 
physical therapy, which is essentially, you know, professionally directed exercise program, to medicines. What kind of medicine are we talking about? So the standard is the stuff you buy over the counter, the anti-inflammatory medicines. Those are ubiquitous, they're effective, but they're also dangerous. And really, a pill only lasts a few hours. So you get a few hours of relief for a chronic condition when you take pills. And that might be enough for the weekend warrior that wants to play golf or play tennis, pop a pill before and after. But it's not really a good long-term solution. But unfortunately, that's what most people do. Next step would be injections. And that's a little more invasive, but when what they kind work. Of injections? So we have anti-inflammatories the same way that you've heard the word cortisone. Mm -hmm. So that's just a a locally acting anti-inflammatory. Very safe injected into the knee joint, but not like the pill you would take if you've heard about taking steroids. It's a different situation. So those can be effective for months. But again, they wear off and they don't treat the underlying cause. And that's why I mentioned it's sort of incurable in a way. You're just treating the symptoms while the disease slowly progresses. So when, um, when should you go see a doctor, whether it's arthritis or whether you've you know, injured your knee, your knee, you've fallen off your bike, you, you know, you smacked it on your way down. Um, when, when should you say, okay, this knee pain, yeah, it's lasted a little too long, I should go see the doctor? It's amazing how different people are. <laughs> Some people will hurt their knee on Friday and be knocking on the doctor's door on Monday morning. Other people will wait years and years because they don't want to get into the medical situation and they come in and they're already crippled. And you go, why did you wait so long? Oh, I hate going to the doctor, I'm coping, I just quit tennis, I just did this and that. So there's a spectrum. And I think people have to decide when they're ready to have treatment. When they come to me as a surgeon, they have to realize, I'm not, the first thing I'm not gonna say is you need surgery. But if they've been through years of medical treatment with pills and shots, I'm gonna say, are you ready for surgery? So I can't tell people when to come, they usually find their way. But if you've had pain in your knee, let's say for what, more than a week, should you go see a doctor? More than three weeks, a month, whatever. Well, if it's serious pain, it affects your sleeping or things like that, then that usually means something more serious and you should probably go within a few weeks of your injury. If it's a nagging thing, you know, you might say, okay, enough, enough, I've had this for a few months. It didn't get better like most of my injuries used to then you probably need to go in, get an x-ray, have an evaluation, and then get a proper diagnosis. Okay. Um, let's talk about the advancements in uh, knee replacement surgery. How has it changed over the last 15 or 20 years? Well, the most important thing is to understand how durable it is. In the old days, people would say, oh, it only lasts 10 years, so I'm gonna live a long time. I don't wanna have another one, so I'll just suffer from 50 to 70 years old and then have one. The technology and the skill of surgeons make it so that a knee replacement usually will last a lifetime. Huh. So if you take someone in their 60s, for example, the odds are, overwhelming odds are they're gonna live their life out with this one implant. And that's really amazing. Materials have improved and things like that. And that's important for people. Even, we even, most of us let people do whatever they want. They can go back to tennis, they can be active. I'm not gonna tell my patient to run a marathon or play basketball, but Surprisingly, some do. That's what they want. But you can go back to, to running after yeah. knee replacement yeah. surgery. You can go back to skiing after knee replacement surgery. I have a lot of patients that ski. So there's really no restrictions? Yeah. It's a what you want to assume is your personal risk. Skiing, I've never seen wear out a knee replacement. I've seen people have accidents. They could have the same accident if they didn't have a knee replacement. Sure. You know, there's ligament injuries and fractures that occur all the time skiing. So it's not the implant, it's just the risk of the sport you do. Mm -hmm. So knee replacement, you know, younger and younger people are getting it for that reason. So, sh so show us, uh, uh, yeah. so, show us an artificial knee and yeah. how, the, what, how the replacement works so, and, and do the, talk about partial knee replacement versus total knee sure. replacement. So one of the things people don't understand when we say knee replacement, they think it's like changing the whole tire of your car. A knee replacement is more like going in for a retread. The major structures of the knee remain intact, but we're just resurfacing it. You can see here that we only trim a thin layer of the bone and cartilage off the top and the bottom, and we mount this on the prepared surface, and then we put a plastic piece in between, and that creates the joint surface. The amazing thing, just like when you cap a broken tooth 
it takes the pain away. So capping the end of the bone where all the nerves are takes the pain away. And so this is a typical knee replacement. So most of the knee joint is still here. We take out one of the three ligaments usually, but that's it. And what's the difference between a partial knee replacement sure. and a total knee replacement? So many doctors will just do a full knee replacement in everyone to get the total job done. But some doctors prefer to do a partial. Say your only damage is on the inside of your knee, okay? And this part of your knee is damaged, but the rest of it's healthy. We'll just replace the one part of the knee that's damaged, would it be the inside, the outside, or the kneecap? And that allows the structure, the rest of the structure, to be intact. And it results in generally a more normal feeling knee and a more normal performing knee. So in most tests, people with a partial knee and a full knee prefer the partial knee because it feels more like them. Are you, do you get back to your normal activities faster with a partial knee re replacement? All things being equal, yes. But recovery is so individualized, it has to do more with the intrinsic nature of a person than the actual operation. And people are also very, very concerned about the mystery of surgery, let's say that. <laughs> They're so afraid of someone putting them to sleep and cutting them open and all that sort of thing. But advances in anesthesia and post-operative pain management and quicker rehabilitation, you know, you can have a knee replacement and never go in the hospital, just come and have it done and go home. And that's... Have it be outpatient? Sure. Wow. Right. So you don't have to spend the night right. in the hospital? Right. In some cases? Yes. In other cases you do? Sure. It What's depends the on the patient's health. So a lot of things. It depends on the health of the patient. It depends on the system the doctor has in place. I feel more comfortable having my patients stay overnight so I can see them and make sure my therapists see them first to get them going and, and make sure their transition home is easy rather than... And there's than no complications after the surgery? Never. No. <laughs> what, yeah, no, yes. what could the complications um, be? So certainly we want people to be as healthy as they can be coming into surgery. Mm -hmm. So you have young people that are fit as can be. They don't have problems, or you have older people that are on heart medications or other things, and we want their doctors to make sure they're as healthy they can be. Bad things can happen in surgery. That's what makes people fearful. That said, statistically, it's interesting to note the most dangerous thing a person does on the day of their surgery is drive to the hospital. And that's a true statement. So everything else is safe. But things can happen. People can get into heart arrhythmias from the stress and everything else, and that's why. We have good systems in place to make their pain less. Our anesthesiologists are fantastic at taking care of them. And the surgery is really quick. A knee replacement should really only take an hour and a half. What, are the, um, what about robotic-assisted knee replacement? What are the advantages to that? Well, it's not clear what the advantages are. A robot is just another tool, just like the other mechanical instruments we use. Um, there's navigation devices, which are computers that help the doctor align the knee and do the cuts and all that. A robot is just another level that it helps design the surgery and help the doctor make the cuts. Most doctors don't feel they're necessary if they do this routinely, but it's popular. Patients think that robots can do everything. <laughs> but medicine and surgery is still an incredibly interpersonal thing. and. I think an experienced surgeon still does better than a robot. It's not brainless surgery. You have to be aware and in the place to make sure everything goes well. So you say the average length of, of uh, knee surgery is about an hour and a half. Um, and you say that they can go home from the hospital either the same day or, or the following day. How fast do you want them up and walking? I mean, once the anesthesia, do within, you get them up and walking? Within hours of surgery. Really? Yes. If a person has a surgery in the morning, and they go up to the floor, the therapist will see them within an hour or two. And remember, wild. Uh, you know, when, I first, used to be that way, when right? I first trained 20 years ago, they would lay in bed for three days and stay in the hospital for a week. You were so afraid, and now we realize that people do better if they get up and go. Everyone knows that lying in bed isn't good for you, and what's that's the, true for What's the advantage of getting up and, and walking right away on the new knee? All the other parts of your body, your lungs and everything else works better. Your muscles don't get atrophied, and people's expectations are changed, right? Instead of the fear, back to the fear of surgery, oh, this is going to be painful and I'm going to be crippled, they get up and they realize, wow, I can walk 
almost as good, if not better, than I did when I came in the hospital because I'm limping in the hospital and now, oh, I have a little pain, but it's different. And the mindset changes the whole recovery. That's pretty remarkable. And, and what's the rehab process? You know, what does that involve and, and how quickly can you really get back to your normal activities? So everybody is different. A younger active person can rehab faster. I tell people essentially, give me a month. Don't plan any major travel abroad. You know, don't think you're gonna go play tennis and go to the gym. Stay at home and, and, and don't go to work and sit at your office desk for eight hours a day and forget to do your exercises. But people, you know, we tell them don't drive for three or four weeks and I know some drive before then. And they just find their way. So. Why do you want? Why do you not want them driving? Well, for three there's or four weeks? two reasons. Number one, they're probably on pain pills. Okay. Some of them are, and that's not against the law, actually. Right. And number two, the reaction times because their knee may be not even if they're driving leg. And so it's, it's, it's the function of the knee, knee sure, moving. Sure, there's from tests the of breaking and stuff. We've done tests to show that they're not as good. So it's a danger thing, but people do it, and it's okay. And the other thing about that is they want them to think about. We have one chance to do this right. I mean, it's your lifetime. Again, this should last you 30 years or more. Why don't we just focus on this? People that are trying to squeeze their knee replacement in between business trips or big deals or tennis competitions probably aren't psychologically ready to have a knee replacement. They need to focus on that. It makes sense, doesn't it? Sure. Um, so we're going to talk about this in a couple of minutes. We want you to hold this thought. It, it, we're talking about the rehab and why it's so crucial to the recovery process. We'll come back to that in just a couple of minutes to talk about rehab after, after you've had the surgery. Um, how, you, say, you say that you can go back and you, there's really no restrictions on what you can do. What about the restrictions? I mean, when you're running, right, it's, mm -hmm. this is this pounding as opposed to the bike which is not, you don't have that same pounding, right. or the elliptical, which doesn't ha have yeah. that. You're saying this new knee can take that pounding that comes along with running. The answer is a qualified yes. Okay. In other words, most surgeons that do a lot of knee replacement don't generally tell their patients what they can or can't do. That said, there's a list of higher risk and lower risk sports. Certainly pounding, just the like your impact, joint, high impact. Yeah, yeah. but why have the surgery if you can't go back to things you like? But high functioning people that have knee replacement maintain that level of function. They don't get better. I don't turn a weekend tennis player into a marathon runner. It's unrealistic. But people that are inactive because of their pain generally lift their activity up. Oh, I can go back to golf. I can go back to tennis. And I, I haven't skied in years. Maybe I want to do that. So I don't want it to sound like it's a perfect joint. It is an artificial joint. It doesn't work exactly like your joint. It doesn't feel exactly like your joint, and there are some things that are compromised, but compared to what you have before, it's a tremendous improvement. But if you do high impact exercises after you've had the knee replacement, does that mean that your new knee is gonna wear out sooner than if you did the low impact exercises? Theoretically, yes, and major studies comparing problems, mechanical problems with the knee replacement in young people versus old people, younger people, do have more wear, maybe they're more active, but it's not exactly that correlation. So certainly common sense rules, but uh, I don't tell my young people what not to do. They self-regulate, it's interesting. When is knee replacement not an option? Um, when other treatments are effective and people don't feel their life is impaired. It's a simple thing that I, uh, when I, see people come in, we can look at the x-ray and it looks obvious. You have arthritis, no doubt about it. And they want to ask me, what does the x-ray show? And I say, well, it's not about the x-ray. The x-ray just confirms the diagnosis that I already know from listening to your story. It's about what you feel the function and pain is and whether you're satisfied with your knee or dissatisfied. So if they're dissatisfied, they should have surgery, having tried everything else. If they're kind of we get a lot of people that are coming in and, and they've, I've, had, I've taken pills for years off and on. I've had a couple of shots with my doctor. What else is there before knee replacement? Can you clean it up, you know, the arthroscopy, clean, looking in there, cleaning it up, would that help? 
I was told I have a meniscus tear. Should I treat the meniscus tear? That's an interesting conversation you have with people because meniscus versus arthritis, people get confused. And they're always wanting to talk about regenerative medicine now or the ability for their own tissues to heal themselves. That's a huge thing we're, we're dealing with now with patients. Uh, we'll talk about regenerative in, in just a second. Talk about the meniscus tear versus arthritis. What's right. the difference? So arthritis, let's, let's think about a knee joint just like an organ, you think about your heart as an organ or your liver or your brain. People need to think about the knee joint as an organ and an organ is just a part of your body made up of tissues that all come together to serve a function. So the meniscus has a function, the cartilage, the ligaments, the lining of the joint, they all have a function and all of those structures can be deteriorated or damaged when you get arthritis. So for one person, the first sign of arthritis might be they tear their meniscus. And that starts this cascade of events leading to degeneration of all the other tissues. The next person might have already had wear and tear of the cartilage on the end of the bone, and that causes a tear of the meniscus. So when you get older, let's just say over 40, and you have a meniscus tear, the first thing that I'm going to look for is to see if you have associated arthritis with that. If it's just as you said in the beginning, uh, you played tennis, you twisted your knee or something, you slipped, and you were fine before, and you have a meniscus tear that an MRI might show, and the rest of your knee's fine. That's a different animal than someone that's had sort of chronic off and on pain. Then they get a meniscus tear, but that's the one thing that started them hurting, but behind that is a bunch of arthritis that was there for years. Okay. So people have to understand the difference. Um, so let's go back and talk about regenerative stuff. So uh, I know that there's something called platelet-enriched plasma. Mm -hmm. What is that? PRP is the acronym, platelet-enriched plasma. What it is is basically your blood, which is full of platelets. Platelets are what help you clot, and they have a lot of growth factors in them. So what's done is your blood is removed and the platelets are separated and concentrated to a 10 times higher level, four to 10 times higher level. Then that platelet is injected into an arthritic joint or to a damaged tendon. And the idea is you're concentrating healing growth factors into this area. So that's been studied pretty well in arthritis and in knee joints, and it appears to be pretty effective maybe not any more effective or durable than some of the other injections, but the important thing to understand is we can't prove that it heals. That's what most people think, that the platelets or even the stem cells when injected will heal. But there's no evidence that that occurs. But what it does show is that it can decrease inflammation, maybe stabilize things and provide people extended relief that they're not getting for other reasons. So I never tell a patient that a PRP shot or a stem cell injection is going to reverse their arthritis. And I tell them it might make them feel better for months to even up to a year, but it's really unpredictable. Is it better to get the, the um, platelet, the PRP injection or to get the stem cells? and just do that year after year after year, as opposed to finally saying, look, I really need to have the knee replaced. The reality is, is it won't work year after year after year because as we talked about, arthritis is an inexorable, incurable disease. And we would love to have something to inject in the knee to stop the arthritis. Then we would do that early on, people would be stabilized, and then maybe they get a booster shot every so often. Unfortunately, the reality is that's not how it works. Repeated injections can be less effective, and frankly, it's unpredictable. So a one-time shot, if it really works in a person, yes, do it again. But in the other group of people that doesn't work, I wouldn't bother keep doing it. But you think of these, like stem cells, they th people think that you inject these and these are gonna grow all the tissue back. Remember we talked about the knee joint is a bunch of tissues making an organ. It's unrealistic to think a stem cell is going to go in there and make all the tissues again. A stem cell is like an orchestra conductor. It has to go in there and tell everyone else what to do. And if all those other tissues and cells are diseased or damaged, they're not ready to perform. So, Great analogy. Yeah. All right, so we talked about this a couple of minutes ago. Why is, why is rehab so crucial to the recovery process after you've had knee surgery? 
Well, it makes sense, right? The, the, what I can do inside a knee joint, I can retread the tire or I can fix, but I can't make the engine run better. So it's like a car. If I give you a shiny new paint job or give you new tires, but your engine's not tuned up, you're not going to have good function. So rehab is everything. And that has to do with, for the knee, for example, your quadriceps muscle is the key. It's the engine of the knee. So a person with a strong quadriceps, a cyclist, for example, they all have strong. They're the best patients because their engine is ready to go. You just fix the tire and they're good. So rehab becomes super important. And frankly, most people like to talk about it, but they don't want to put the time in. So the therapists are coaching them. And I simply tell most people, can you just get a stationary bike and put it in front of the TV and ride it for 15 minutes a day? That's maybe all you need to do. And if you've never done anything like that, and you do that, and you do 45 minutes to an hour a week, make tremendous difference. After surgery, of course, we've done a lot to make the knee not bend well and everything else. So if you want a good outcome, you have to do the work. It's not, you know, it's not just a miracle surgery and you're over. It's, I mean, it's like, well, you can't have the surgery, get up, walk you know, yeah. home the next day, and then you're good to go. Yeah. You really you, need to rehab. You really need to do, yeah. What is the success rate for knee replacement surgery? Depends on how you define it. <laughs> so one way to define it from a surgeon's standpoint is, as you pointed out, how long will a knee last? There's a term we use for that called survivorship, the esoteric term, but knee replacements the failure rate of a knee replacement requiring another operation is probably now down to about a half percent a year. That means that 20 years on, 80% or more to 90% of people will still have their knee replacement working well. That's a tremendous number. But that's not necessarily the success. Another way to measure success is measures of their function and what they can do. And then finally, patient satisfaction. That this is what my job is customer service. I want you to be happy with what I did. So we ask patients, how satisfied are you with the knee replacement? And in most studies, 85 upwards to 90% of people say they're satisfied. Our problem in knee surgery is that last 10%, 10 to 15% that may be dissatisfied, maybe because they can't do some of the sports or Believe it or not, some people will still have pain and that will affect their life. So 85% to 90% satisfaction, 95% of people will have it for 20 years. So that's pretty good. Any final thoughts, Dr. Bugman? Well, I think as a surgeon, I know that I'm at the end of the food chain, as you will. When people <laughs> get, as you pointed out, they have knee injuries, they see their doctor, or they see their, their primary care doctor, or they see somebody and they're really reluctant to come see the surgeon. And it's important to know that when you come to the surgeon, it's not always just to have surgery. We're very insightful about the process. And frankly, I've seen so many knees and so much arthritis and so many injuries in my 25 years of practice that I can give people insight. You know, sometimes they'll say, well, if you don't want surgery, why'd you come to the surgeon? But they're seeking information. So for me, it's like I love taking care of people and I love to make them better, but I know in the vast majority of people that walk in my door, they say, I don't want surgery, but I know in five minutes that I can make them better, but I will never try to talk them into surgery. They have to find that themselves. So don't be afraid of knee surgery. When it's the right time, it's life-changing, and that's clearly the, the, what knee surgery is about. That's why it's so successful. Thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks, Susan. Scripps is ranked number one in San Diego and repeatedly ranked by U.S. News & World Report as among the best in the nation for orthopedic care. If you'd like more information on knee replacement surgery at Scripps, please click on the link or go to scripps.org forward slash videos. If you want more critical information about your health, we take care of you from head to toe. Uh, just subscribe to our Scripps Health YouTube channel and also follow us on social media at Scripps Health. I'm Susan Taylor. Thanks so much for joining us. It's our mission at Scripps to help you heal, enhance, even save your life.